So, hello everybody. Welcome to August and the drug meeting that comes with it. The delicious food and beverages that you're consuming now, uh, you have to pay for them when you go, so don't forget. Uh, that way they let us back next month. Um, we have a Google Plus community and a mailing list. Uh, please join either or both. We announce all of our meetings on those two places. And we record videos of our meetings. So if you missed one or if you wanted to see something again from the presentation, uh, just check that out on our website. And some news, some things happened last month. One thing that happened was that there was not a zero day exploit for the JRE, which is cool. What was the zero day exploit patched? Right. The previous one. Oh, really? Yeah. Neat. <laughs> so it's been 42 days since the last known zero day exploit. Also 42 days since the unpatched exploit happened. Yes. Awesome. So that's. Can you click the, is there a Java zero day? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Awesome. Yeah, at the bottom, this is javazeroday.com. At the bottom, there's, a, there's another website, is, the, is my Java hackable or something? And it usually says no, but I guess it says yes for the last 42 days, so that's cool. Um, right, so uh, Gorkum brought this one up as an interesting news item. OSGI has decided to target JavaScript as a platform uh, in addition to Java. Yeah. Right. In addition, they're also looking at C and C++ as platforms. Um, I can imagine what that might mean for JavaScript. I really don't know what it would mean for C and C++. I guess it's like dynamic library loading and with isolation. Um, Do you know? Yeah, and also the, the dependency management is there on with OSGI, uh, with the versioning and all that. Uh, I guess the, the biggest trick is that you should be able to run, with OSGI, you should be able to run two versions of the same component. Uh, I guess that's kind of hard with C, C++. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> it's like, well, I'll just have another libc. Uh, uh. I can't even <laughs> imagine doing that in JavaScript because, like, yeah. Because well, they're okay. still in the same... Well, I can kind of imagine like two jQueries or something. On RFP level only, so they are right. the proposal right now. Still so thinking. It's, it's interesting work though. Crazy namespaces in the linker or something in C. It would have to be Pretty namespaces. Package name to every it would have to be, wouldn't it? Hey, Dell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we'll see what that is. I, yeah. I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it looks like a match rate to have a JavaScript Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, OSGI actually started as a um, device, uh, small device framework. Then it grew into to enterprise world. Yeah. So the original intent was to that you could write uh, applications that run on small devices, like a mobile phone, or even smaller. Right now, I think there is a lot of home automation uh, frameworks that are built on top of OSGI. Mm -hmm. And the problem with those is they always need to interface a device, which basically you need to basically run on top of silicon, and that requires C++. So OSGI always had that problem, but no one tried to solve it. Uh, this is the first attempt, but I guess. Yeah, because the core API is very small, right? Oh, yeah. I, it's the stats, I forget. It's like three types and 13 methods or something. I it's, mean, it's like Eclipse Equinox is the largest implementation of OSGI. I don't know why, but I have seen something like 100K uh, OSGI implementations, which is the full stack. So okay. you, you can implement very small. Uh, so it's, it's not that bad. Right. Okay. So it'll be interesting to watch this unfold, see what they do. Uh, so there's a bunch of conferences coming up. This is the same conference calendar we showed last month. It hasn't changed. Um, so what's the best value? Still DevOps? Looks that way. Well, JFocus is close, though. Maybe better. 
looks like Double about. Oh yeah, Swedish beer is not cheap. Belgian beer is cheap and delicious. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, so total cost of, of attending is probably still best at Devo. Yeah. <laughs> Although, uh, unfortunately, the culminator has caught on to the whole DevOps thing, and they seem to now shut down as a matter of course during DevOps week. So that's yes, you got to stay after DevOps to go there. Uh, right. Oh, so Adib, who's our speaker tonight, and he is on the way. He assures us. He's called me twice. Um, he recommended this Neo4j tutorial. He's been to something else that they put on previously in Toronto. Um, it's on September 14th. It's an all-day thing. It costs $99. They provide breakfast, lunch, maybe dinner. Um, and he said they do a good job teaching you their stuff. So he wanted to add this to the news. Um, oh, there's a deep. Hi. All right, welcome. Thanks uh, for being here. Uh, my name is Adib Saikali. I'm, I'm presenting again today. Um, always enjoy doing that at the Jug. Uh, so today I just want to share with you three tricks that I've used in the past to m improve the reliability of the applications I've worked on. Um, I highly encourage you to uh, ask me questions. And of course, these are all um, kind of my opinions about things. So you'll probably have different opinions. I also should warn you that the code that I will show you is uh, not the most polished code in the world. It's kind of extracted from different things and simplified for presentation purposes. So uh, with that disclaimer, I guess we can, uh, we can kind of jump in. Um, I just want to spend a few minutes and kind of give you my theory about reliability and how to make things really unbreakable. Um, and then I want to show you the three techniques, which are the circuit breaker, the self-diagnostics, and the structured logging. Um, I'll give you some resources at the end. So for the question of what is reliability, um, well, it, it just means that things work according to the specification. And um, that's obvious. But it should also mean that things work when hostile bad things happen, like unexpected network routers go down or um, some service that you depend on is not there. You don't want everything to just get completely fried. Um, there are a lot of uh, examples where one system breaks and it cascades. Um, anybody here read a book called uh, Release It? If you have read a book called Release It, it's got a big airplane on the front of it. Raise your hand. Oh, cool. OK, nobody knows what I'm talking about then. <laughs> if you've read that book, then, then you're going to definitely know what a circuit breaker is. But if you haven't read that book, you really want to go run out after this, buy it, and read it. It's the best book ever written. And, and there's a, sorry? Uh, I never bother with those. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so uh, in the book, there's a whole bunch of stories of where this uh, reliability issues happen. One was an example of uh, um, a special that some uh, retailer had put on. And uh, everybody was supposed to get this free shipping. But the server that was running the free shipping, the shipping calculations, was down for maintenance right around the time of Christmas period, where everybody's trying to buy stuff. Something along those lines, and that locked up all of about a lot of other systems that depended on it that were just regular browsing, had nothing to do with like scheduling shipments. So um, anyway, I'll give you I'll give you more examples as we go along. Um, so when the system fails and everything will fail eventually, you want to be able to figure out why it failed very very quickly. You want to be able to take corrective action, and you want the system to be uh, restored to full functionality in the shortest possible time. Uh, anybody here who's worked for big companies where when something bad happened, you had like a VP and a VP VP kind of breathing down everybody's neck and a conference call with 200 people on it? I, I've had clients where that was like, they have these conference lines with secure phone numbers that people call in. There'll be like 200 people on the line trying to figure out why something really bad is going on with some banking system. Um, so uh, how to make things reliable? First, you want to understand about reliability is it's, uh, it's actually a wicked problem. Um, and a wicked problem is actually a technical term. A uh, wicked problem is a problem where you don't understand the problem until you've developed a solution for it. 
So how do you make your system reliable? Well, you won't really know until it breaks a few times, right? <laughs> and you introduce ways to, to, to deal with that. Uh, also, you could spend enormous amounts of money trying to make something more reliable or solve a wicked problem um, because there's no, there's no way for you to know that you've actually solved it. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. There's only different degrees of, of good or bad. Um, and there's always some twist to the problem that makes it unique. Um, and the solution is a one-shot operation. Whatever you try out at the beginning of the project is what you'll end up with at the end. <laughs> um, there's a great book on this called Wicked Problems, uh, called Dialogue Mapping. Anybody here read that book? Yeah. It's another fantastic book, strictly about how to deal with the social aspects of wicked problems where you get a room full of people where nobody can agree on what the solution is, what even the problem is. So it's pretty cool uh, techniques. So when you want to solve a wicked problem, you recognize that uh, there's basically a known set of techniques and tools that you can apply and you're going to use a combination of these tools. So if you increase your kind of list of techniques that you are, list of patterns for lack of a better word, uh, tricks, patterns, then it increases the chances of you coming up with something that kind of works. So bottom line is you want to learn as many tools and techniques as you can. Ah. Five pillars of reliability in my uh, philosophy is transparency, automation, testability, simplicity, correspondence. Um, so I could, you know, spend a lot of time talking about these, but we're going to do them really, really fast so we can get to the code. So transparency and testability, uh, you want to be able to know what's going on inside the application. That's right? pretty obvious. If you can find out what's going on, then you, then you can figure out what's wrong. Testability means, well, you want to be able to know that things are working. And I'm talking more than unit testing here, way more than unit testing. I'm talking systems and production, being able to test them. Uh, you want to be able to economically verify if things are working or not without spending a fortune doing it or you know, requiring a lot of stuff. Uh, automation and simplicity, I don't think I need to sell these too much, but uh, every change, well obviously you want it to be scripted, no human involvement, everything is scripted, it's the world of DevOps, right? Um, you want to be able to do the same thing when something goes wrong. So when something goes wrong, you want to be ideally able to run one script that tells you what went wrong and how to fix it. That's the idea of kind of building a self-healing system. Um, and then, um, you know, things are simple and scripted, it's easy to take corrective action. Uh, correspondence is, is, uh, is a very simple idea. Uh, who's opened up code where you read the source code and it does not use the same terms that the, that the things on the screen use? So the screen might be talking about like, you know, customers and profiles and whatever, and then the code talks about something like, custom like uh, uh, account and the just completely disconnected reality between what the application shows on the screen and what the code looks like internally. And that just happens naturally on uh, enterprise systems because they evolve over time and people don't refactor, rename, and as they understand the problem better, they don't make the code look better. Um, so the only way to, to so, so the correspondence is the idea is the code and the terminology used in the code and in the requirements is the same. It's also known as the ubiquitous language from domain-driven design, if you have not uh, run into that. Another book that I highly recommend. Um, so having said those things, those are kind of five major principles and we could spend a whole week on each one and give lots of examples and techniques, but what we'll do instead is go to the first one. Circuit breaker, right? Um, so it's a reliability design pattern. It's documented in that book that I recommended it's called Release It. And um, it gives you, f um, it, the circuit breaker is a good example of these five principles in action. Um, so let's first look at the problem that it solves. When you depend on an external system and that system is not accessible, like you're calling Canada Post to find out how much it's gonna cost to ship your product somewhere, um, Bad things can happen, right? Because you've got a customer waiting there on that uh, checkout button and they might get confused or lost or whatever. So when external systems, they can, only, they can slow you down, but the most horrible thing they can do to you is if they, if they lock your threads. Anybody had that? A failure of an external system caused you to run out of threads in your application server. Anybody seen that? It was our own database. Sorry? It was our own database. It was your own database, right? Same idea. 
yeah, the JDBC driver was was waiting on something that was some like TCP wait state for some connection. So there's point is anytime networks are involved, bad things can happen. And in, in fact, it's if you look at the details of it, it's not that easy to tell if a remote server is down or not. You really don't know with TCP. Unless you go in and you change kernel settings and TCP timeouts and all sorts of other stuff that you probably haven't done or won't do too easily. Um, so when a system A fails, it causes B to fail, which causes C to fail. And then you get that situation where you know you've got a problem because the users aren't able to do something, but you don't know who to blame. If you have an enterprise system, like say a banking system of some kind, a larger system where there are a lot of different teams, uh, people will play the blame game and they'll be like, it's not my system, it's your system. No, no, it's not my system, it's this other guy. So we want to get around that and you could reboot everything and hopefully things will <laughs> work, but that might not be practical. Uh, so what's the solution? The solution is to use the circuit breaker. Who's familiar with circuit breakers just from uh, your house? Everybody's got a circuit breaker in your house? What does it do in your house? What's the job of the circuit breaker? Anybody? Why do we have them? It cuts power to a circuit that's overloaded. It cuts power to a circuit that's overloaded. Why? So that you don't burn down your house with melting wires. That's right. So you don't burn your, down your house with melting wires. So that's exactly what it is. It protects your house from overheating of the electrical circuits and a fire which will burn down your house and maybe kill you and your family. So. What we want to do is we, we want to do the same thing with, uh, with remote systems that we're calling. We want to make sure that we keep track of how often a remote system is failing. Okay? So if that remote system fails too many times or fails too quickly, we want to shut it off. We want to basically make whoever is calling that remote system fail right away. If three threads have already been in some TCP, like they're in TCP hell, they're waiting for some remote system to respond and it's not, you want the fourth thread that calls that code to immediately die, potentially. Who can see the value of that? And when that remote system is dead, it might come back. So what you want to be able to do is you want to build in recovery so that eventually when it's back, it just starts sending calls to it again. It doesn't fail it at that point. Um, so that means that our breaker is going to have three states. Uh, think like electrical circuits where it's closed means that electricity is flowing through, calls make it to the remote system. That's what closed means. It can be open, which means no calls make it, which is kind of counterintuitive because like you think open, it's like available for business, right? Closed is closed for business, but it's, it's the circuit breaker, electrical terminology. It's an open circuit, no electricity is going through. Or it can be in the half open state, which means that, okay, I think I'm going to try to reach this remote system. And if I can, I'm going to go into the open state. And if I fail, I'll go back to closed. Is everybody clear what this is going to do? Any questions about what the requirements are? All right. So hopefully you understand what this circuit breaker is going to do. So what I'm going to do now is uh, show you some code. Uh, where's my Eclipse? There we go. Maybe let's refresh Eclipse here and make it... Uh, so all of the code on here is already on Bitbucket available or will be soon because I kind of cleaned up some of the stuff as my brother was driving me to the presentation thing. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's a bunch of previous presentations kind of mashed together. Uh, so with the circuit breaker, um, here's what it looks like from the perspective of a user. So let's take a look at the test. So imagine that we have um, where is this thing here? I love really low res Eclipse work. Um, all right. So here's our, our local service, famously named with the I. Don't hold it against me. I've moved past that. Uh, 
So uh, I local service here. We've got a local service that has a method called foo. And uh, we're going to implement this service with a callback. So this service is going to call some remote system. And our remote system has got an interface called bar. So foo's going to call bar. It's really, really simple. And the remote system has uh, got this amazing implementation. So please read this code. I'll drink some beer. Everybody clear what it does? <laughs> it just simulates failure, right? You tell it, if you tell it fail the next time bar gets called, it fails, it throws an exception. Right? So that's how we're gonna get a system that kind of fails on demand. And this is how you use these, you employ the circuit breaker. So in here, um, I've got this local service which is implementing the local service. And I've got a reference to my remote system. Somebody is going to pass this to me in my constructor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a circuit breaker and I'm going to give it uh, a name. Um, and uh, the reason why I'm giving it a name is actually registers itself as a JMX uh, bead. Who's familiar with JMX? Raise your hand. Okay, a few people. So if you haven't, I'll show this to you in a second. And uh, so once I create my breaker, when the method foo gets called, I could go in here and I could do something like uh, remote.bar. Uh, and uh, the problem with this would be that if bar misbehaves, my circuit breaker does not catch it. So we want to kind of wrap the call in something. So that's what breaker.execute does. So breaker.execute, you implement the circuit breaker callback because we don't have a uh, wonderful, uh, what, uh, closures and all that stuff that's coming in Java 8. So we have a do in breaker method that uh, returns an object. And then within it, um, you just call the, uh, the you, you just basically make a call to the remote system. So it doesn't return anything in this case. You could, if you wanted to, you could improve this. I use this example in training courses I've taught in the past. So the code is not as production quality as you want it to be. It's more like kind of example training code. Um, right, okay, so that's local service with callback. Any questions about how you use the circuit breaker as an end user? Just implement the interface and pass the calls through it. What this will allow you to do, let's put this uh, a breakpoint, let's say here, and let's put a breakpoint here, and let's run the JUnit test and the debugger. Okay, so we're going to be in here. Now I'm going to show you what's the value of this being a J console. Let's stay bring up. Let's hope this works. Right, it's not there yet. That's right. And that code has not executed. Okay. So let's actually create the MB in here. Okay, go back to our console here. All right, here we go. So when I created the circuit breaker, so who's, who's seen J console before? Who's never seen it before? Okay, J console is a really cool tool. It's like uh, J Visual VM. So the older cousin of J Visual VM. It lets you connect to a running virtual machine and see what's going on inside of it. So with J console, you can see like memory, threads, classes, summary of how the virtual machine was started. But you can also see these M beans. So the M beans here, I created mine. It's called com.example. And it's my circuit breaker. And you can see it's got a reference to the remote system. Now what's really cool about it is I've got these attributes. So I don't know if you can read them, um, but I'll, I'll read them out to you here. This one says cumulative failure counts. 
how many calls have failed to the remote system. Uh, this one is cumulative calls when, when it was open, how many are failing, getting rejected and dying right away. This is how many have failed so far. Uh, this is the max failures before it will open. So in this case, it's now configured if you get two calls in a row that fail within, the, within a certain window, it's going to go into the open state and stop working. Um, reset time in milliseconds. So it's going to wait in this example here uh, 60 seconds, so a minute. So if it's been a minute since it's been uh, rejecting calls, it'll try again to see if one goes through. And if it does, it'll, it'll switch over. And then there's what, what the status of it right now. Right now it's in the closed state, so calls are allowed. Um, there's also operations I can perform on it. I can, I can say, uh, put it in the open state. And that will actually cause whoever calls next to get rejected. Comments, questions? Um, and so let's put it back in the closed state so we don't interfere with the test. <coughs> So let's uh, take away this breakpoint here. All right. Actually, let's stop this here. So now, now you kind of see what the um, what the M bean does, and the M bean goes back to the principle of transparency, being able to see what's going on in your application. What's better than being able to hook into into the JVM, find out what your circuit breakers are doing for remote systems, and potentially even dumping that stuff out with a scripting interface. Uh, so that's that idea. So I'll show you a little bit about how, uh, taking a look at the test again, to give you an idea. So for example, in this case, um, we, we tell it to fail, and then we make one, two, three, four, five, six calls to it, and then we find out that, uh, um, you know, the failure count starts out at zero, then the cumulative failure count stays at zero, and then eventually, after it's all these calls, we want to 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 check that it, it failed uh, the, the open state. So this test kind of goes through all the different combinations where you know the test when the remote system is up, then it goes down. Test when it's down, then goes up. Test when it's down, then up, then down, then up. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, combinations of stuff. I'm not going to bore you with the details of this code. What I want you to walk away from is the idea that you can build a circuit breaker. You can, it's really easy to use. Uh, you can expose the circuit breaker as a JMX MB into tools like JConsole uh, and other, um, like th there are data center management tools like HP OpenView and all the IBM Tivoli's, all this expensive network infrastructure monitoring stuff that you can get, which can react and page somebody or phone someone when something changes in a JMX MB, for example. Um, so that's that's that. Um, anybody interested in the details of how it works internally, how it's implemented? Okay, one couple people. All right. Um, so if you've not seen how easy it is to write an mbean in the, uh, this is interface here defines the kind of behavior of the mbean. So I'll give you a few seconds to read it. What's special about it is the name mxbean. Did I make a typo in my uh, breaker circuit? No, it, didn't, it doesn't have the I prefix. That's right. It's because I evolved past that. Between, 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 the, between that interface and this package, I evolved. I used to do Windows COM programming in the past, so <laughs> I date myself. <laughs> right. uh, I, I query interface, right? No, I don't. I never liked Hungarian notation. Never used it. Okay. So the point is, if you want to make any Java object into uh, into an mbean, just imp uh, just add mxbean to an interface, and then you register it. So let's take a look at uh, the circuit breaker itself. So what the circuit breaker is doing is uh, it gets a name, a domain, and a name because uh, mbeans have a domain as part of their name, and they have a string, which is also a name. You want the combination of name and domain to be uh, unique. So it goes through, it creates a configuration object, um, creates the initial state of the circuit breaker, creates an object name, and then you do this little nice management factory dot get platform mbean server. This is how you get access to the JVM's uh, mbean server. And then you simply call register mbean. You pass in the 
object that implements the MBean interface, which is in this case this, and the name you want it, then you're done. Okay? And then you can kind of convert your evil JMX exceptions into runtime exceptions. You're one of those guys, huh? <laughs> I evolved from checked exceptions. <laughs> There's applause. <laughs> <laughs> Can arm wrestle afterwards about that. No, I'm um, with you. I got some nasty so. to a lottery roll on there. Yeah? yeah? OK. All right, so, so basically, that's, that's what it is. Let's take a look at how the execute method works. There's, a, there's two versions in here. There's one that uses a dynamic proxy, so you don't have to implement an interface. But I'm not going to show that for, for lack of time. It's very simple. Uh, it goes through and says, OK, Get the current state based on the current configuration. What is the state of the current status that we're dealing with? If it's open, then um, OK, we're going to reject the call because we're going to throw a circuit breaker open exception so the call doesn't go through. And we're going to update how many calls we've rejected. If it's in the half open state, then uh, try a call. If it works, close it and return the result. If we get an exception, put it back into the open state. Um, if the circuit breaker is currently closed and everything is working, great. If there's any kind of exception or error, uh, record the failure. And when enough, when the number of failures has accumulated high enough, it will automatically stop working. This thing here. Uh, Sorry. Well, it depends on the configuration. So in the current configuration of the circuit breaker, uh, where is the circuit breaker configuration here? There is uh, a bunch of settings like max failures before opening and reset time in milliseconds. So this, when the breaker configuration gets open, it gets past some of these values here. You get when you create it. Uh, you'll notice that this configuration object is very cleverly synchronized everywhere. <laughs> so, because <laughs> you know this is running in your app server, uh, you want to get. I'm sure I could have done something more clever than sticking synchronize in front of everything, but then um, that would require more time and be more complicated to teach and explain. So, it just synchronized everywhere. You could use like atomic integers or something if you wanted to. Uh, so yeah, so that's basically all there is to it. See anything else there to? Yeah, there's some enumerations like statuses and states and um, oh yeah, there's the state of it. That's where it actually accumulates all of the uh, how many things have failed, all that stuff, and that's everything in there is synchronized. So this is the logic. For example, when you call get current state. It's checking to see if it's open, find the current time, figure out how long it's been, and if it's greater than the reset time, then you know change its state and then return it and track stuff. Uh, really simple code, nothing you couldn't understand even if you were drunk and just need to sit with it. Okay. Comments, questions? Yeah? Is there uh, an open source implementation of this? Uh, this is under the Apache license. <laughs> You can you can take it from my vid bucket and use it and make it better. But like something that's production ready. Well, I've used this, okay. so you can take this and just run run through with it. You know, I haven't. Uh, it's kind of a balance between like you can definitely. I've had people definitely take this and just customize it for their own. I don't know what they've done with it after that. Those are usually like banks and stuff like that. So. Yeah. One thing that would probably make sense in production like in a real context yeah. is to not make that linear. Right now you have a field attempt and then you wait a fixed amount of time, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 It yeah. probably makes sense to say if you have like two attempts, you wait like yeah, you might. Of two, you know, like it, it's just do an exponential wait on it. Exactly. So you might want to have a, a pluggable strategy for when you decide to open, half open, all that, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great point. Problem was that there were upwards of ten thousand clients. So 
you know, you get 30 seconds of peace and then mayhem. Then you get a thundering herd with 10,000 clients trying to get at you, right? Because there's not that much clock over 30 seconds. That's right, yeah. So we, we found that randomizing the uh, time to closing a circuit breaker helps a lot. Yep. If you have more than like two clients. Okay, that's true. Mm -hmm. Very good point, great. Anybody else? Any other comments or questions? Yeah, a similar technique that we use is just to have really short timeouts on your back end. You know, if you have this thundering herd possibility, you know, if you don't get that database set connection within 500 milliseconds, throw away the client. Just say, come back later, try again. <coughs> you, don't, you don't build up like, you know, thousands of Absolutely. up in your web server and your whole web server falls over and yeah, time, timeouts are your friend if you remember to set them everywhere. <laughs> that's the that's ruthless. Yeah, that's the hard part though, because when you're when you're working with large like banks and I used to do consulting, that's what I used to do a lot of. It's it's a lot of people, huge projects, lots of time. Nobody knows what's going on. You couldn't guarantee that all the timeouts were set. Yeah. All right, uh, okay, so that's that one. So what I want to do now is kind of uh, just summarize this and, and, and move on. Um, oh, actually, yeah, so I'll give you this demo. All right, so I promised you, uh, so who's going to try Circuit Breaker after this? Please look at it in more detail for your system. Okay, cool. Yeah, who's going to buy this book? Uh, no, no, not the, not the second one, release it book. Yeah, buy it. Buy the release of book. I think Ship It is a project management book. Okay. Release It is the is fantastic because it's got lots of great stories and lots of examples of how systems fail down and break and patterns and anti patterns and all sorts of really cool stuff. I've read that book like four times. So. Well, each cl each server in the cluster has its own circuit breaker because it's got its own threads, right? So that sleep helps. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just an introduction to the idea. So hopefully you'll uh, you'll investigate it some more. I guess um, you'd also have to have nice ha error handling when your circuit breaker does throw a circuit breaker open exception. Yes. To tell the user, oh, you can't talk to PayPal right now, or. Something like that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You want. On the, you definitely don't want them to just sit in a loop and just keep calling you. Well, even if they did, they just die right away. <laughs> so <laughs> nothing bad will happen. Um, so actually, if you're actually building like one of those uh, systems that where you sell an API, like let's say you're one of those web metrics companies where people install the metrics software into their phone application and then they do stuff and they're calling your service. If your service is down, in, in, when you distribute a client library that talks over the network, put a circuit breaker in there, you'll save your service. Exactly. You'll save your own service from getting completely destroyed by people hitting refresh. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, right. So the next thing I wanted to show you is um, takes a little bit. All right. So the okay. Let me let me just run it and uh, and I'll just show you what it does. And then you'll understand what it does and the problem that it solves. It's this application here. Just a, a, it's an application. It uses Spring. It talks to the database. All this other kind of stuff. The details are not important. What's important is when there's a problem with your application, how do you find out where the problem is? And uh, in this example here, I'm just going to log in with uh, user and user. And boom, I'm on this current application status page. So when you, uh, so what this is telling me is uh, that there were 19 tests that have passed, 20 tests, and 19 tests, uh, one that has failed. Um, and the idea is to program your application with a bunch of code that 
tests the application from the point of view of the application. Like for example, if you ping your database server and the database server is up, that doesn't mean that your database server is working because your application thread pool could be completely locked up for some bizarre reason. Because maybe there's a bug in the JDBC driver. Whatever it is. Uh, so you want to be able to get a view of the world from outside of the app and from inside of the app. This is the view of the world from inside the app. And uh, so in here, there's basic stuff. What's the OS, info, JVM information, like uh, this one tells me the status of all the threads of the JVM. There's 17 threads peaked at 19. This one is telling me the memory uh, status. Um, this one is giving me what the garbage collector has been up to. Kind of useful to know. Um, this one here is, ignore this, oh, this test here, you don't want to know about this one. I forgot what it does. No, it prints out every spring bean you have, sorry. And every profile, so it's kind of like. Uh, this one here is kind of interesting. Anybody here use Aspect J with load time weaving? If you use Aspect J with load time weaving, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? The weaver doesn't kick in for some reason. Then nothing works and you don't know. So I don't have Aspect J load time weaving configured, so my test that's testing that Aspect J load time weaving would be working is failing. So that's kind of an example of something that's useful to know. Um, this is a test here of the Spring, uh, Spring Security's global method security, proving that it works. Uh, this is testing that JNDI lookup works correctly. So I know, that, for example, that my data source is configured and is correctly configured in Tomcat. Um, this is actually tested uh, my database by executing not a select one, which is kind of like everybody does that. This is more like I'm going to go to a table that has three rows in it, value one, value two, and value three, and I'm going to pull them back and compare them. I really want to know that I can get to a table of my own in the system. Uh, and then these ones here, the transaction tests, these run through uh, all the possible propagation combinations for transactions with Spring and checks that all of them work. Because if you have something like aspect J not working, then they will fail. Okay? Uh, so anybody, everybody clear what these tests? It's kind of like JUnit for within your app. It's accessible over the network. And the idea is to write your own application-specific tests. So these are general tests here that would work for any type of Java application. Uh, so let me show you the basic framework for how this works. It's, it's very creative. It's called status. So you get this uh, status test, which has a test method that returns a status test result. And you can see I've don't have I in front of the interface name. <laughs> and we have a get class name, so we know what's the name of the test that's actually running this. Um, so if we do F4 on this guy here, we'll see our type hierarchy. And uh, let's say try the aspect J test. Uh, no, no, I don't want to explain aspect J, so uh, let's try this one. All right, JVM garbage collector status test. So. Uh, this is extending from an abstract test that just helps you accumulate results, like returns the class name for you and creates a new result and all that other kind of cool jazz. So again, this is another really cool usage of mBeans, JMX. You can go to the platform, to the management factory, get the garbage collector MX beans, and uh, you can then read the status of the garbage collector from within the app. Okay. Comments, questions about that? I just accumulate them as a really simple string result in there, it gets printed out. Now, I have a version of this that returns a JSON and all this other kind of stuff. It could also be an MB. Yes, this could also be an MB. Well, it is an MB in this case. So you could go with JConsole and actually read this garbage collector status with an MB. You don't have to do anything. Your test result could be an yes, the test result could be an MB. I didn't make it that sophisticated in this demo. Yeah. I'm actually uh, doing something like this right now. I'm just wondering though, where do you store your test values, like the test input? What do you mean? So I'm working on a system where I'm exposing all the subsystems as JMX beans. Sure. You can tell, you know, it's yeah. on them. And uh, so the IT ops guys are looking into it. Yeah. And they've asked if 
I can add in the functionalities to execute tests from exactly what you're saying, which is from inside the application through the JMX interface. Okay. So, you know. Oh, right. Okay, so I get it. Things like you know looking up devices and. Right. So you can you can have operations with parameters. Oh, this one is terminated. Let's just run it again. So you can have a, uh, a JMX operation that takes parameters and you type them on the GUI. Or get them from some other bean. So let's connect this one to the M beans here. Let's see if we can find some. This is the Tomcat. Yeah, none of these take parameters, but you can have operations that take parameters, and then you would. Does that does that make sense? Sure. I mean, I've got like seventy-five systems, so I'm thinking more like you know, mm. best just use a copy file or ah. You know, okay, so 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 in that case, I would recommend that you use Jython, and you make the whole thing scriptable and load up all the mbeans and call them from 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 Jython. Then then your ops people can write scripts in Python to interact with those mbeans, they could store those settings as in the, in the Python script. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically what WebSphere and uh, WebLogic, and I think now even JBoss does this. They, they have a scripting interface, and they use Python because, well, it runs very nice, nicely in the JVM. Or you could use JavaScript if you want to be cool. <laughs> so. Well, you can use that, uh, just use the generic scripting API. Yeah, you can do that too. Yeah, but you always have to change the haircut. Yeah, I know how things are If you use Ruby, KRuby, you need uh, to grow a beard first. Ah, Dude, I, I was just a puppet cop. Yeah, <laughs> it is at least 60% yeah. beards. Surprisingly yeah. well groomed beards, actually. Yeah, they're very meticulously kept. Yeah. But, but right. very beard centric. So you have to get a choice because some of your users might not. Uh, well but you should be over 20 <laughs> before you try. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> See, if I grow a beard, I get stopped at airports. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, being from the Middle East and growing a beard is not a good idea. Um, so I, I heard it, uh, going back to that scripted configuration yeah. thing. I, somebody's name is attached to this, and I can't remember who it is, but Basically, some, somebody's theorem that every configuration file eventually becomes a scripting language. Oh. So you can kind of cut that off at the pass and just start with a scripting language for your configuration file. Yeah, it makes, makes sense to me. Then you avoid creating a new bad language. Yeah. All right. All right, so I, don't, I want to get us to the beer, so I'm going to do the last one right now. So you guys get an idea of what, what this is. I'll make this code available. This one is not publicly available on uh, Bitbucket, but I will make it available. So you can, you can play with it. It's not really that hard to build your own either. The idea is what's important. Um, the last one is my favorite, because it's one of my favorite pet peeves in the programming industry. So let's see who else has this. Who's had systems that produce massive amounts of useless log files? Yeah. Info, 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 lots of stuff in there. Who's written messages to log files that you could not understand, even though you were like, I want to kill whoever wrote that log message? And then you like, show annotations and you're like, oh, that was me. OK, I changed my <laughs> mind. <laughs> you know? So what I'm talking about here with the structured logging is to gain transparency to what's going on, but in a way that's monitorable. And I'm absolutely not talking about yet another wrapper that for you to select between log4j or commons logging or whatever. It's just. It's horrible, all of those logging wrappers. So what am I talking about? I'm going to demonstrate this by running um, a very simple program that's going to print out two lines. Okay, if you take a look at this, please read those two lines first. Anybody want to take a guess what the two special things about those lines are? I'll buy you a beer if you guess right. Okay, that's exactly what it is. It's definitely the N300 and the SEC300. So I owe Jonathan a beer here. Why is this useful? So what I'm talking about here, imagine being able to tag everything that goes out into the log file with some unique code 
that you know is unique. That's the important part. Because you can process it automatically. Yeah, exactly. You can grab it, you can process it, you can monitor it, and you don't end up with the half-baked sentences and bad grammar and it's all the other. Yeah, it's so exactly. So we want to make things marketable. So the question is, what can we do in the Java code to make sure that the messages that we're producing to the log file have at least a unique code and a unique module name? So, and I'm going to show you this. It's my opinion on how to do it. You probably disagree with me. Um, so let's take a look at the main program. And uh, you'll notice that uh, I do not have, oh well, just got a bug here. This is not properly. Uh, <laughs> I, had to, I had to extract this code <laughs> on the drive here. Um, so there we go. Now it's much better. So you'll notice here that I'm not doing this. Logger, which is what most people probably have in their code. That is bad. Very, very, very bad. Because that means the programmer has to figure out what that log message is. And usually, you have too much information in your head. Things make sense when you write the message, but they don't make sense when, the, when you need to interpret the meaning of that message. So instead, what we want to do is we want to say no to this and yes to stuff like this. So you'll see here that I've got, like, I want to print out what's the temp directory that the application is using. So I create a temp directory info message. I pass it, well, if I look at it, you'll see that, oops, you'll see that this one takes in a directory path. I cannot possibly create a temp directory info message without telling it what the temp directory is. Now, if I want to be more strict about it, I could have passed a file object, like a Java file. <laughs> and, and then for sure, hopefully, that's not all. Um, so I'll get into the mechanics of how I make it work later. And then you, once you create a message object, you, will, you call log, and you say, hey, uh, info message, write yourself to this logger. That's what we're doing. So we're not calling the logger. We're creating an object, and then we're passing the object, the logger we want it to log itself to. Comments, questions? So here's an example where, let's say I'm calling this security service. And my security service has a very creative do something method. And the do something method here is going to uh, do some work. And then it's going to discover the database is down. So it creates a security database down error. And it calls error.log and passes the logger. So who's kind of understanding the pattern? You create an object, you program it with the values that you need, and you tell it to log itself. Now, you might be asking yourself, why is this useful? Or who's kind of horrified that how many classes you're going to have to create? <laughs> it's like, oh no, you're going to have to create millions of classes. Are you insane or drunk? I'm yes. No, anonymous inner class, if you do this with anonymous inner classes, you get to buy everybody on the team lunch for a week. Yeah. <laughs> and if you do it twice, you get to shave your head. Oh, no, it hasn't happened to you. Uh huh? No. <laughs> I, invent, I, I came up with this for my own team, so I haven't had to do it yet. Um, yeah, so. Uh, No, you don't want to do that. Let me show you why. Let me show you what does, what does Eclipse F4 do? What does F4 do in Eclipse? Shows you all, all the type hierarchy, right? So if i am got a system with 75 modules, 500,000 lines of code developed over the last 10 years by a whole lot of people, I can go here to, and I want to find out what gets written out to the log file so I can build a playbook so I know when these types of things happen, I should do whatever, something else. I can go here to my log message class, hit F4, and Eclipse will very kindly tell me all of the different places where these objects are defined. And that's the basic idea. We want our IDE to help us find out all the places where they get written out. Why? Because I could go in there and I can improve the log messages and add more details to them. Okay? So that's the reason why, why you want to do that. So now that you kind of see what is, what is a log message, well, a log message is something that has a code enum, because every message has to have a unique code, 
it has a message and it potentially has a, an optional throwable that says this is why this problem occurred. So let's take a look first at the code enum and how that works. So, so when we look at the code, en uh, 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 code enum, it's an interface and it doesn't have I in it. So please read this. <laughs> That's what threw me. Yeah? I like the eyes. <laughs> Oh yeah, that too, I did that too, yeah, there was a lot of I's in that one. Um, so this one here, for every code enumeration, you can ask it for the code space that it belongs to, you can ask it for its integer code, which, well, you hopefully want to be unique, uh, you can ask it for its description, and you can ask it to format its message with any number of parameters. So let's take a look at, first, well, what is the code space? Well, the code space is just my way of making sure that you know, uh, you come up with like unique prefixes. You need a central place to put them. So it's simply an enumeration uh, which has a module and a description. Presumably you have one of these for your whole entire application. So it's got to go into whatever that magic jar that gets included everywhere. And people would go in here and they would register whatever are the code spaces that they want to generate log messages for. Okay. Anybody understanding code space? Now, I can make it more fun by uh, uh, adding a uh, method like this. Uh, um, doing something like uh, code space dot, you know, uh, values. I'm not going to bore you with that code. Just imagine a map. You throw stuff in a map. Find out that really somebody didn't mistype this because there was a long, long list of stuff, right? Um, so we'll... Uh, so we'll go here to this. We just have a big wiki page. It's not really as maintainable. Yeah. I like, I like, well, I like this idea because you could stick Javadoc on all this stuff which is always a good thing. So here's my, uh, okay, so now let's take a look at the codes. So we have this, another enumeration, we're gonna call it error codes. You'll see that this enumeration error codes implements the code enum. So it's got the, tell me the code space, tell me the code, tell me the description, which you would have anyway. So you have these uh, three private field, private finals, code space, code, and description. You can go in there like, uh, here's my host is unreachable. That belongs to the environment code space, which is unable to connect to a network host. Here's your payment processor down. Square is down. Where are the square guys today? Oh, it must be Vicky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're not here today, so I was going to put in here square down <laughs> instead of payment processor. <laughs> uh, Security database down, so that, that's, that's an idea. So you can go through this and hopefully, this is, this is again the one place where all your codes would be. Any questions or comments about this? There's another big advantage to this if you're making a, a public API that other people are gonna use, which is easily Googleable error messages. Which is, I don't yeah. know if you've ever used the Oracle, JDBC drivers, whatever, and they return very nice error codes, and if you Google it, you get an answer. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, I, as much as I love like you can love to hate IBM products, they all have this pattern. They all have unique strings for all the messages they produce. Because they also, if you have a requirement to produce the messages in multiple languages, guess what? This will make it possible for you to produce messages in multiple languages. Which is cyber is extremely happy to Yeah. One thing I'll add is I tend to create an enum for each subsystem. Right. So what you have here, like implementing the inter interface, I, I wouldn't like I wouldn't have just one. You know, I know you ha you have an interface because you can implement it multiple. Cases. Yeah, I have I have an interface because that's what the log message uses, and I, I kind of wanted like I really did want one global place for everything in a particular application. So 
So what? all your error codes are in that one email? Correct. Yeah, the, so all I'm saying is that I, the only difference from what you're doing, yeah. I tend to do is I tend to create a separate enum for subsystem. I mean, you, you can definitely do that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, I think, a very much a kind of a whatever makes sense for your situation. But it fits with your model. Yeah. So, so the same thing, there's uh, info codes, which is pretty much the same implementation. Now, here's why I like to say I got a little bit clever. Check that out. What's so special about this one? There's a percent S in it, right? Can you see that? So what that basically means is what I skipped over is you've got the format method here, and which is very cleverly just calling string.format, which is the, ape, the, the Java printf style formatter, saying get me the description um, that's associated with this uh, enum, and just give me back the actual value substituted. So for example, that's how when we look at the, uh, when we run the program again, You see that it was printing out the temp directory is set to foo, a home foo temp, right? So that's an example where that's the percent %s was replaced with home foo temp. So let's take a look at that message. And you can see just how easy it is to create those objects. Yes, you got to go extends and then ask Eclipse to auto-generate the constructor for you. So it's just calling super with the info code for temp directory and then uh, setting the message by calling format with the passed in directory path. So the idea is when you construct one of these objects, in the constructor, you form your message. Comments, questions? Okay, a couple more minutes and then I'm done. Um, so how does this work? There's, okay, I showed you the log message, which is the base class, and uh, it has a create log message which just looks to see if there is a message object uh, string stored in here. It just does a percent %s with the make it formatted all nicely. And if there isn't one, it uses the default message attached to the code. Maybe that's all you need, so just to make life simpler. What that allows you to do is to define things like, where's my uh, security database down? Here is defined with just a call to super. So it could be as simple as that, just a classical super. Um, and then uh, if you take a look at like say info, oh it's so magical, it just has an if statement in it. When you call log, it just calls logger.info. Checks if there's a throwable, if there is, it includes it. So, so in summary, I, I think this approach is good because you can use Eclipse and your IDE to find out all the places where, sorry, <laughs> that will be on the video, isn't it? <laughs> Shouldn't drink and talk. I'll edit it out. Huh? I'll, I'll edit it Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, right, so info log message, extends log message. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so what I was trying to say is, uh, uh, the big advantage, Eclipse can help you find all the places where these messages get generated. It also means that you can audit them. You can check that the grammar makes sense on the messages. You can improve the quality of the messages in one place. And if you are selling a product to different countries where the administrators do not speak English and you need to, uh, you need to basically make your messages available in other languages, uh, this makes it possible to you know, pass in a locale and it will you know, print out the message in French or English or whatever happens to be the target language. So I hope that uh, you enjoyed my presentation. To uh, wrap it all up, uh, we talked about the, 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 the five, what were the five principles here? Just to go back to them, see if I delivered on them. Yeah. Three. No, I did three demos, but I did five principles. Yeah, so there was the five pillars of reliability, transparency, and uh, Transparency, you can get that with the circuit breaker. You can get that with the status stuff I showed you. You can get it with the logging stuff, the structured logging. Uh, automation, we saw some elements of that with, uh, with, uh, in all of those examples because they're all like, kind of easier to script. Uh, testability, uh, simplicity, yeah, it's all in there, I think. Oh, and the one thing that nobody challenged me on that I will award another free beer for, 
Uh, what, is the, what, was, what is the nasty thing about the status? What's wrong with this? What's so bad about it that almost makes it useless to implement? Well, it's a little bit concerned Okay, anybody that knows the URL uh, can see it without authenticating. I grant you that, but you can protect it with a password. Yes. Okay, so you can protect it, you can, uh, so yeah, you need to protect this URL. In fact, I had to log in for this, but that's not what I'm worried about. So I... If there is some memory problems, experiment space, and just There's not enough memory to run this? Okay, fair enough. Not quite what I'm worried about. I don't know about worried, but I would probably put the ones that Okay, yeah, you can put, okay, fine, cosmetics. All right, I'll tell you what it is. What happens if all your threads on port 8877 are all locked up right now? What good is this if you cannot get to the threads that are running it? So who can see the problem, right? Now you can see, oh no, how do I get around this? Well, you get around it with another principle from, the, uh, from that released book called compartmentalization. So I'll show you that by, um, uh, let's go here. So what you would do is you would essentially configure a, another port that's strictly for this. So here's how easy it is to do it. So in Tomcat here, I've got my Catalina exec thread pool, which has, say, 150 threads. And I've got my max five threads, which is my status thread pools. And then I can define a connector on port 7777, which is going to process those requests not on the main thread pool with all the other requests, but we'll process them on the status thread pool. So this also means that I can block that port from being accessible via my firewall. So I forgot to mention this and I thought it was important. So that's it. I'm done. Thank you.